So now, let me try this again. It is my pleasure to introduce Judge Alvarez, and I won't go through the whole spiel again, but um, we are so happy to have her, and uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning, and thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you for having me back. I am thrilled to be here, and it is a full house. Um, and I know that that was part of the commitment of having us back, that um, it was important that this message be heard loud and clear um, by a majority of you. And so I am um, here to discuss with you the impact that Guadalupe Teen Court um, is having in the community, is having in the lives of individual teens um, who adjudicate the cases, and also in the lives of the teens, the offenders, uh, who come before a jury of their peers. Before, um, Excuse me, is the video starting? Thank you. Before I get into discussing with you uh, more in depth the theory behind it, I want you to hear it firsthand from team members themselves as far as what this program means to them. There's a quote on my bedroom wall that states, be a voice, not an echo. And that's exactly what Teen Court does. So Teen Court to me basically means a community and a group of people that come together and what we do is we resolve issues within the community. Guadalupe Teen Court has definitely made an impact in my life as well as others. I've been in Teen Court for about five to six months. And I've been here for about a year now and it's just great. The reason why I joined Teen Court was because it was really interesting to me. I'm, I've always been one for like the ideal like law and I've always wanted to get into that like as an ideal future career. I have learned a lot through hearings and through the community leaders and other professionals we have met along the way. So about two years ago I joined Guadalupe Teen Court. Little did I know that two years later I'd be able to go to DC and to meet so many of these people. It's really provided an opportunity to exhibit leadership skills. And we really truly believe in restorative justice rather than punishment so that we allow our fellow teens to restore themselves, build themselves, and build great character rather than feeling like they're punished. We want them to build off and be great people. It's an outlet for us to speak on who we are, what we believe in, what we care about, and that's one of the most amazing parts about Teen Court. For me, that was like somewhat special because it kind of like, hey, I can actually see myself doing this one day because at first I was like, maybe that isn't my thing, but doing these hearings and seeing like these people and their situations kind of got like to maybe have like, a bigger mind about how the world actually works and how this exactly goes down. Guadalupe Teen Court has provided several opportunities for me to do things like go to Washington DC, which is something I would never otherwise have dreamt of. And that has definitely made a very big impact on my life. I ended up making a lot of friends, seeing different sites, doing amazing things that I never thought I could do. There's nothing better than showing up almost every Wednesday, being able to educate ourselves. We have great opportunities handling real cases. That's what I love about Teen Court. I get to make a difference with my friends, people who are so inspiring every single day. Have a great time, learn about politics, learn about how to help the community and truly makes great citizens for our nation. Yeah, Teen Court is pretty amazing. This club, the members, and our mentors continue to inspire me every week and keep me coming back. It's really inspiring that people can actually go places and do things just by being in here. Thanks, Guadalupe Teen Court. It's the best part of my week. So thank you, Guadalupe Teen Court.
So I'm sorry if all of you weren't able to listen to that precisely. Um, we may have to replay it later when the sound system is a little bit better, but uh, we'll make sure to do that because it's very significant, the message that each Teen Corp member has to share. Um, so Guadalupe Teen Corp started back in January 2015. And to date, it has become a five-way partnership. It's very important for me to let everybody know that you know things good things happen when courageous people come together and take you know take the right action um, we're very fortunate that not only are teen court members committed to their work with teen court but we are supported by um, superior court the juvenile division the probation department at superior court also we're supported by the town of Guadalupe, we're supported by the Arizona Organizing Institute, we're supported by the Guadalupe Branch Library, we're supported um, also by the Tempe Union High School District, and today we are very fortunate to have um, several VIPs with us. I like to say it that way because when I learned that VIP means very important people, um, I, I want to, that's exactly who I'm about to introduce you to. We have two Teen Corp members. You saw two of them in the video. They are here with us today, Christy Pino and also Oscar Figueroa. Can you guys stand up, please? <laughs> and we're also very fortunate to have Michelle Hirsch. M Michelle is advisor and mentor to Teen Corp. You also saw her in the video. Just, and as it is, as relationships happen, because really any sort of movement um, as we have become, we've become a movement for restorative justice, not only restorative justice, but transformative justice, and I'll take you through that journey. Um, this relationship with Bridget actually started because uh, Sue Ellen Allen, who's with us also today, she's the founder and um, CEO of her own nonprofit for reinventing reentry, she introduced me to Bridget, um, and and then it took off from there. You know, the conversations continue to alert the public about the huge potential there is in creative thinking to solve problems that we encounter in our criminal justice system. The main goal of Guadalupe Teen Court is to empower youth in the community to help change negative and delinquent behavior in their peers, to foster civic engagement, and to model the value of education. Teen Court members assign constructive consequences designed to help juvenile offenders make better choices in the future. You heard it told over and over, right? How much pride Teen Court members hold in their hearts in being able to be jurist, neutral and impartial, unbiased, as teenagers, and be able to listen to their peers who have committed an offense, curfew violations, uh, shoplifting, some assault cases, if it's the first uh, offense and they qualify for diversion. But when they are listening to one of their peers feel distraught about what happened, feel afraid about the consequences that may come after this action, the disappointment they feel from their parents, the disappointment they feel from society, from their schoolmates. They come to Guadalupe Teen Court and they face a jury of their peers that is completely concerned and committed to listening with the intention of restorative justice. And what that means is looking to the whole person, asking the relevant questions, that can establish a foundation for moving forward. For example, one of my favorite cases um, to talk about is a young man coming before the a jury of their peers where they are the four person, they are the judge. I teach them to be the judge, I teach them to be the bailiff, I teach them to be the victim's advocate, to be the attorney. It's basically, like a classroom setting. That's um, a, a law school classroom setting. That's how I run it. The, the model, as you can see here, the difference between the youth-centered approach versus the traditional model. 
What we do at Guadalupe, at Guadalupe Teen Court is a youth center approach. A traditional model, as I just mentioned to you, is one where the young person feels ashamed, disappointed in themselves, disappointed in, in what the, the future may hold, and really ambivalent about what the future may hold. A youth-centered approach is the complete opposite. It actually involves allowing the adult, right? So for example, myself as a judge, I've been through trainings, I've been through conferences, I've been through you know, law school as, a, as an attorney, the whole process. I allow myself to be guided by the youth themselves. I allow myself to listen carefully to the impact they want to have, to what is relevant in their lives, so that the solutions that they come up with are respected, so that the ideas they have for how to better impact the lives of their peers can actually uh, be relevant to the discussion, right? I encourage that. It's very important to look also at the youth center approach. If you notice, I, I think this picture is phenomenal because it really depicts what we're doing here. You see, even the child carrying the sword has a blindfold on, right? Youth are very equipped if trained to understand the concepts of justice. They are very equipped to understand what their implicit bias can be and their responsibility to check it at the door to be able to listen carefully to the needs of their peer you know, who needs restorative justice. And so some of the consequences that they have decided uh, are things like membership to the YMCA if someone says they're lonely and they just shoplifted because they wanted a friend and they were peer pressured into it. Um, they decide consequences of tutoring, giving tutoring to the, the teens because you know, then there's more support for them. They ask the teens to draw pictures of what justice means, of what it means to be an honest citizen if, say, the, the offense was shoplifting. They ask the parents to get involved. They, they're so really creative. The, the most creative one I have seen, and even the probation officers were so impressed, was one um, young person who had shoplifted came before the court very distraught, very afraid, and expressed just how difficult high school was for him. The teens deliberated, because that's what they do, after they hear the story and they ask questions and they listen to the family. And I'm literally, I'm in the corner guiding the process, making sure that they're going through the process of weighing mitigating factors and aggravating factors and coming to a consensus about what is right and fair for this individual. This is, of course, after coming to training Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday, week in and week out, to be prepared to, to be equipped to actually deliver justice in the best way possible. They decided that they wanted the teen offender to join their court, to join their club. They said, he doesn't have any friends. Why doesn't he just join us and we will be his friends? Everyone, all the adults in the room were speechless, including myself. I had never thought of something like that. But it worked. It works. Um, and, and of course, we're sensitive to the type of offense. We're sensitive to the safety of the community. We're sensitive to the needs of justice. But what we're doing here is transforming lives, not repeating the cycle that then routes our youth you know, into the criminal justice system. So we need to be courageous and creative in our efforts. My approach to teaching is rooted in two models, two models that have benefited me greatly. One is the Socratic method, and the second is the organizing model. I, I mean with complete sincerity that 
when I engage, as I engage team court members in the Socratic method. So for those of you who don't know what the Socratic method is, I learned it in law school. My entire education before law school had been learning how to memorize, learning how to regurgitate information, learning how to correctly answer in terms of someone else's perspective, in terms of someone else's, someone else evaluating my correct answer, a lot of multiple choice tests. Even with my master's, I, I, I wrote a lot, but it was still evaluated through traditional lens where I had to embody someone else's vision, someone else's way of thinking. Then I make it to law school. And law school is a completely different experience. Rather than having a professor lecture at us, they would ask us questions. Every single day, it was questions, never answers, never even a hint of what the correct answer may be, always questions. And it was incredibly frustrating for me because my brain had not developed that skill. I had the skills needed to get into law school, thankfully, but to succeed in law school, I needed I needed a different way of thinking, a different way of processing information, and a different way of seeing the world, seeing my role in the world. And so the Socratic method goes back to Socrates. It, it is a way of seeing yourself, your role as an individual in the community that you serve, that you're a part of, and then that community within your society. At every level, discovering new answers, discovering new angles, discovering new potential. So for example, when I meet with Teen Corp members, um, I never have answers. I always ask them questions. If we start with what are the three branches of government, that's where we start. And then, you know, we elevate their critical thinking from there. And whenever they pause because they don't know or they're nervous, they're going to tell me the wrong answer. I remind them, use your resources. I remind them, there is no wrong answer. Let's piece it together. Let's learn together. And so by taking them through this journey, I can see in all of them, it has been an amazing experience for me, I can see their confidence, their shyness and insecurity transform into confidence. Their hesitation transform into empowerment. And they continue to stay involved at that level which is remarkable to me that as teenagers, they would not shy away from being taught like law students. But they hang in there every Wednesday, eager to continue to, to trigger that, that activity in their minds you know, that causes them to think further about their own position in life, their own experience and how that informs their way of thinking versus just looking to me for the answers. The other model that I use is the organizing model. And that's because a lot of times as adults, you know, we're, we're taught, I remember being taught to network. And I didn't understand, well, what is, how, how does that work? What do you mean? The organizing model, it's my way of approaching the learning that um, Guadalupe Tincor does from the angle that every person succeeds in a community. It is never, you know, a person alone that, that pulls themselves up from their bootstraps, as the saying goes. It is always a matter of building community and having the courage to seek out those resources, to seek out, seek out that expertise in others. 
And so by training them in this way, they ask their parents for support, for example. You would be surprised how many teenagers feel uncomfortable asking their parents for support. But in order to attend activities, in order to engage in the program, I make sure that they know we need you to communicate this to your parents. We need you to communicate this to your teachers. We need you to communicate this to your friends. And so it keeps, the community keeps growing and, and as, it, as it states here, we continue to celebrate each new addition to the community of restorative justice. In this way, we really take a superficial understanding of justice to a deeper level each time around. This process has been completely transformative. It is a transformative journey, a transformational journey, because what I instill in the youth is it's quite simple. It's what I believe deep in my heart is that we are continually evolving. There is no way that we can ever say we are done learning. Maybe we can say I have obtained a degree and I've attained a goal. Maybe we can say we've heard this case and, and we are so proud of ourselves for making a difference this way. But what I'm really vested in is making sure that teen court members take away from the experience that they are power brokers in our society, that they themselves are the future, that we are relying on them to take these principles of restorative justice and help us reform the justice system that's not currently working. We use teen court as a vehicle, so it's not it's a means to an end, it's not the end. Although it is a very, it's a very great vehicle because restorative justice requires that level of innovation and involvement, especially when a teen uh, is hearing cases that they can relate to. I can't tell you how many teens themselves um, will say, oh my gosh, I almost did what they were saying they did. I'm so glad I didn't, and I'm so glad I can help them. In honor of Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who I know was hosted here at ASU, and uh, she is definitely one of my sheroes, um, I, I want to tell you, and this is remarkable, I, I want to take a moment to use her words to explain something very profound. She... She has her, her, my beloved world is her book. And she talks about being in the fifth grade. And this is something that I hold dear in my heart as a way to ground me in knowing that, that it's all a process. She says, there was one more reason beyond the pleasure of reading the influence of English in my mother's various interventions that I finally started to thrive in school. Miss Riley, our fifth grade teacher, unleashed my competitive spirit. She would put a gold star up on the blackboard each time a student did something really well, and I was a sucker for those gold stars. I was determined to collect as many as I could. After the, after the first A's began appearing on my report card, I made a solemn vow that from then on, every report card would have at least one more A than the last one. A vow on its own wasn't enough. I had to figure out how to make it happen. Study skills were not something that our teachers at Blessed Sacrament had ever addressed explicitly. Obviously, some kids were smarter than others. Some kids worked harder than others. But as I also noticed, a handful of kids the same ones every time, routinely got the top marks. That was the camp I wanted to join, but how did they do it? It was then, in Miss Riley's class, under the allure of those gold stars, that I did something very unusual for a, shot, for a child, though it seemed like common sense to me at the time. I decided to approach one of the smartest girls in the class and ask her, how to study. 
Donna Renella looked surprised, even flattered. In any case, she generously divulged her technique. How? While she was reading, she would underline important facts and took notes to condense information into smaller bits that were easier to remember. How? The night before a test, she would reread the relevant chapter. Obvious things once you've learned them. But at the time, deriving them on my own would have been like trying to invent the wheel. I'd like to believe that even schools in poor neighborhoods have made some progress in teaching basic study skills since I was in the fifth grade. But the more critical lesson I learned that day is still one that too many kids never figure out. Don't be shy about making a teacher of any willing party who knows what he or she is doing. In retrospect, I can see how important that pattern would become for me, how readily I've sought out mentors, asking guidance from professors or colleagues, and in every friendship, soaking up eagerly whatever that friend is willing to teach me. I decided to take this time to read this because I know I'm in a room full of teachers. <laughs> whether you are teaching to an audience or whether you are a mentor to someone you deeply care about or whether you want to transform the criminal justice system, you will be teaching. And I take that snippet coming from Supreme Court Justice, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor to say even her in her excellence had to figure out how do I figure it out? And she took risks in the fifth grade asking the smartest kid, right? How do you do it? Because you're consistently there. And it's not about intelligence. Sometimes it's not even about hard work. And that's what I am so dedicated to teach at Teen Court. It's how do you route all your effort to make the biggest impact in your lives and in the lives of the community. What that requires is investing in curiosity, making sure that a young person is surrounded by opportunities that they can ask questions about. It all goes back to how well do we ask questions? At least in my experience, that's what it boils down to. Even when questions can be hard, questions can be difficult, we face insecurities because we don't know the right fact, I have found that I cannot teach anybody anything, but I can make them think. And when they think, then they have the skills to move forward in life, pioneering new efforts and adding on to the efforts we have established. In restorative justice, choosing consequences requires them to, if, if you can embody this, I'm going to take you through a mini training. The role of a jurist is to be neutral and impartial which means you do not take into effect the, how the person looks, their accent, what they're wearing. The training is you must look at the situation. Well, how do you look at a situation? You have to listen, right? Because surely the person in front of you, if you're not allowed to take any of those factors into consideration to be neutral and impartial, then how do you evaluate the situation? Well, teen court members have learned, as I've been trained, that Lady Justice is blindfolded for that reason. Because Lady Justice has the scales of justice where she weighs the facts as she knows them, as she listens to them, and she weighs the law. And so you match it up. Now, as adults, that may seem very easy, but when you have someone's life in front of you that you're directly impacting, the tensions grow high, the, the consequences can really 
uh, be tough to, to deal with. Teen Corp members are constantly being trained to think in a way where they're not only listening intentionally, caring deeply, but also understanding that their decisions have the potential to have a great impact, positive impact in that person's life. So I just want to stress to you, you know, the depth of, of what they're doing. Back to asking questions, more questions. The restorative justice model that we apply is one of five that are available for teen courts nationwide. I opted for making sure that teens participated in every role. There's other teen courts that have an adult judge ruling over cases, and teen courts participate peripherally. That wasn't the model that worked, in my mind, the best. It takes a little bit more effort from the training aspect and the time investment, but as I see it, I don't want little replicas of me. I want each individual to be the best they can be. And the, the, I couldn't have said it best than this quote. Many of us see things happen and we just see things happen. And we retell what happened. We see an apple fall, the apple fell. We need to focus on asking why did it fall? And that's exactly what teen court members do. A young offender shows up and they say, I committed this crime. They ask why? What's the underlying current that's keeping this young person from thriving? Because it's about disrupting that recidivism. Which by the way, the recidivism percentage in teen court cases is 9%. I would like to think that for Guadalupe Teen Court is even lower, uh, but it's very effective. You heard in the video several Teen Court members discuss that they never thought they would be able to travel to Washington, D.C. Well, just very recently, last October, we added another component to the Guadalupe Teen Court program. It became apparent that teen court members are not just loyal to restorative justice, but they're engaged in the transformation of their own future. They have dreams and goals too. They want to understand the world, not through a TV, not through just the internet, but they want to see it, they want to feel it, they want to smell it, they want to taste it. So we started the DC Ambassador Program, which it's really a way of paying it forward, as I like to say, because so many, for example, of our teens have never been in an airplane, have never you know, been to a monument. They, and how do you begin to dream about your own hopes and goals if you've never been exposed to something? I remember my first exposure to you know, food other than Mexican food was in college. Most of my friends say that, that it wasn't until college that they were exposed to other types of food. Well, how remarkable it is, I believe, to, ex to expose yourself to, to different earlier on, right? Um, and so I understand some of the economic challenges, perhaps, that come, um, come up for teens. And so as part of our program, we ensure a scholarship program that allows teens to go now to DC and, and again, at the DC, at, during the DC ambassador program, I indulge them in the Socratic method. You know, they, they want answers about history, look it up, tell me about it, and I will ask you further questions to clarify whether or not you're thinking about it critically. Because that's, that's the spirit of learning. This model is a transformative model. It's not just restoring something. Restorative justice is about making the victim whole. Really, that's where it originates. We want to make the victim whole. We want to repair the harm. We want to instill a value system of respect for the law. 
but also what do you do once you respect the law? What do you do once you follow the rules? Does that really mean that you're not gonna get in trouble? Well, actually, statistically, we know that's not the case at all. And so at this juncture, we are so committed not just to restoring harm, but to promoting a transformation, a transformation in the psyche of young people who offend themselves more than anyone else, uh, because by, by deciding to shoplift, it turns out they're offending themselves and their future, and then they're again in a spir downward spiral, but to restore their confidence so that in taking charge of their lives, they're building power. And I know that that, that that term is not often understood, but by building power, I mean they are co-creating the system, the society that they live in, and having, hopefully, confidence in the society they live in. So much of what, um, what I've seen happen is that teenagers do not have confidence in the society they live in. They do not trust the system that is designed to protect them. And I believe that the only way that we can journey ahead and have that transformative effect, transformative impact, is by providing a setting. In, adult, in the adult world, we call it procedural justice, where you treat defendants with dignity, respect, and transparency. In restorative justice model with teens, It's the same thing. Teenagers are going to become adults. The justice system is meant to be a place where people are lifted up, where people can solve their issues and move forward with their lives. And so I believe that by being rainbows in someone else's clouds, we can do that. Here's the information, um, this last slide, for how you can learn more about Teen Court. And are there any questions? <laughs> Do we take questions now, Bridget, or no? We have time for like one. One question? We have one, one question. I think, yes, Suelen. Well, what do you think the most important impact would be that, along <coughs> that King Court has made on these participants? Either the, either the, the children that have the teenagers who have gone in with a challenge, with a problem, that made them have a poor decision, or with the kids that are making the judgment? The most. So I can tell you honestly that the, the full scope of the impact will not be measured until you know, years down the road. Um, and you know, people do longitudinal studies tracking people's progress throughout their life to, to track that. But I can tell you that I know both um, the teen offenders that come before a jury of their peers and teen court members hearing the cases share the same type of sentiment in a consistent basis. And that's that by participating in a system that, that has control over their lives, that, has, th that, that they know is a part of society, that they know someone who's been impacted by you know, the criminal justice system, they know someone who's been incarcerated, a relative, a friend. By participating in it, by being active in it, they are less afraid of it. And then by being less afraid of it, they're more willing to speak out and have a relevant voice that can be heard about how it can improve. So teen offenders leave saying, thank you, I'm going to do what I have to do, and I'm so glad I don't have a criminal record that I, and, and I can go on and apply for a job. 
teens who hear the cases say, I'm so glad I'm here, that could have been me. I don't wanna end up in prison because of something like this, and I'm so glad we're doing this so that others don't have a criminal record when they're 13, 14. We've heard cases as young as nine years old. So it's, it's really, the system is made up of people. People are the answer. People can be the problem and people can be the answer. But it's just a matter of how willing are we to think outside the box. In your words, so Ellen, not just check the box, but think outside the box and, and recreate it. I have, yes. I think, so, so just to be very clear, when I say that people are the problem, people can be the problem and people can be the solution, it's because you know, our society is us. So absolutely, I, I take great pride in, and enjoy actually in knowing that whatever shapes me and molds me shapes those that I teach, shapes those that I coexist with. And so the same responsible way I teach teen court members that they are co-creators of their own existence as they also profoundly impact others. So innovation is something you carry in your mind and you carry in your heart. And I know that I'm in a room full of innovators um, and I thank you each for your commitment to the, to the progress of our society and our, the reform that we so desperately need. But ask the questions. That's what I would leave you with. Ask the questions. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So absolutely, we are always needing guest speakers. We always need um, people to say, I am going to show up and I'm going to care about sharing another skill, sharing another profession, sharing another um, way of thinking, other questions. Because, I mean, how many of you can say honestly here that you don't learn something new every day, right? Every day. But just know that teenagers are in that same path. There is, we shouldn't place them as separate from our adult learning experience. They are on their way to being adults themselves. And, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll leave you with this. I am the product of people who helped me learn to think. I am the product of uh, mentors that encouraged me to, to take my voice and, and own my, my spirit, own my, my way of looking at the world, and not shift gears because of trying to fit in to a mold that already exists. I think we're in a time when we can do that. We have, we really, really do have um, a responsibility to do that to think outside of the paradigm that we've been presented with. Thank you so much. <laughs>